Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. A very warm welcome uh, to all of you. Thank you for joining us uh, today in the panel on data, AI, and the new society. My name is Nathalie Bertels. I am senior researcher and valorization manager at IMEC CTPK Leuven and co-chair of the BDVA Task Force 5 on policy and societal issues, together with uh, Freik Bomhoff, also chair of the um, BDVA Task Force 5 and senior researcher at TNO, and Alyosha Burkhardt, a senior researcher at BFKI. Uh, we will be your moderators for the session. This is the main session of track four. So our focus is on our society and our society is to be considered a stakeholder uh, in the AI systems life cycle. Uh, this is an important topic, an important discussion, and uh, one I think to which we should all participate from different sectors, so from, as different stakeholders in the AI value chain, uh, as developers, deployers, and users uh, from different disciplines in research, and also as citizens, as civil society. So I would very kindly ask you to already start participating right now uh, to uh, use the WUVA Q&A chat to ask your questions to our panelists. Uh, here I make a reference to our housekeeping rules, so make sure you use the WUVA and not the Zoom chat. Uh, and to also be active on Twitter, uh, tweet and share about our panel uh, today. I would like to uh, kick off uh, the panel by introducing a fantastic lineup of speakers that we have for you today. Uh, we were very happy that uh, she was able to join us, uh, Professor Joanna Bryson, Professor of Ethics and Technology at Hertie School Berlin. Her research currently focuses on uh, the impact of technology on human cooperation and new models of governance for AI and ICT. And since July this year, she is one of the nine experts named by Germany to the Global uh, Partnership on AI. Thank you also to Andrea Renda uh, for accepting our invitation. So Andrea, Senior Research Fellow and Head of Global Governance Regulation, Innovation and Digital Economy at SEPS and Professor at EUI, member of the EU High Level Expert Group on AI and the Advisory Group on Economic and Societal Impacts of Research for the European Commission. We're also very much looking forward to the intervention of uh, Sabine, Professor Sabine Amon, Professor at TU Berlin, with focus on philosophy and ethics of design uh, and technology. She is spokesperson of the Present Futures Forum Berlin and head of the Berlin Ethics Lab. And also thank you very much, Professor Raja Shatila, I triply value Professor Emeritus of AI Robotics and Ethics at the Université Sorbonne in, in Paris, a member of the High Level Expert Group on AI, a chair of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, and co-chair of the Responsible AI Working Group of the Global Partnership in AI. So this is the lineup of speakers we have for you today. And well, data, AI, and the new society, it is a, uh, a name, a topic, it could cover a broad range of interesting questions. And I, I stress the broad range. So we also <laughs> had a very difficult job in preparing because there are so many different things that uh, are relevant to be discussed. I think as a starting point, um, we, we can say that it is not our goal to have more data at all costs not our goal to push AI at all times, to push it everywhere in all applications. Uh, there is a widespread um, development and deployment of AI, if I can call it an AI revolution, but we need a purpose for this. We need to set a goal to the benefit of our society. And we need to uh, set a goal that we want to create a better, more resilient, more sustainable society. So we've asked our panelists to reflect on this very important aspect. The first aspect being the one of sustainability. 
So I would like to give the floor to Professor Joanna Bryson to comment on, on this as first and to reflect and share her views on this. Okay. Uh, Joanna, you have the floor. Okay, great. Well, uh, th thanks very much for the, for the floor. Let me see if I can also get the screen now. Uh, yeah, that looks, that looks promising. Okay. So, um, let's see, I'm going to play. So the, um, there we are. Okay, so, so thanks a lot for having me here. It's a really important set of topics. It's, I'm, I'm a newly in, not only at the Hurdy School in Germany, but also in their, our newly constructed Center for Digital Governance. And um, it's just mind blowing how much our lives are changing with the digital, uh, you know, including that it just never would have had uh, the you know, meetings with no gaps between them. Raja and I, this is the second time we've been together in four hours uh, for totally different meetings that I didn't know that was gonna happen before. Um, so, uh, whoops, why are you guys seeing the uh, thing there? That is really weird. Yeah, just a second, let's try to pull out of that. I have no idea why that happened to you, but hopefully this will now stop happening. Zoom, all right, so Zoom reality, there you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good thing I was monitoring on the desktop as well as the laptop. Okay, so who knows why that was happening? The, the, um, the point is that in our kickoff, we just had a huge discussion about uh, technology and uh, sustainability. And I think there's a really important point to be made here, which is that, uh, uh, if we don't solve the crisis of governance that we're in right now, that, that, that I think it's not just about artificial intelligence, it's about uh, the digital transformation, about the, uh, how much cheaper and more quickly we can transfer uh, property across the entire planet, then we need to get on top of this problem in the next few years because we know sustainability is already an issue. We already are having climate change uh, related deaths and conflicts and things like that. But we kind of, uh, so I hope that this is going to be a period of rapid change. I mean, the pandemic is a terrible thing, but there's a, there's a you know, and I don't want to in any way underestimate that. I, I'm sounding too flat affect and, and, uh, and neurally atypical or something about that, but the, it's a terrible, terrible thing. But we are in a period where everyone understands now we have to change. We had to change. We had to do things we've never done before. And the thing is, there's more to come. We, we absolutely have to change to handle uh, the changes of, of climate change and to reimagine uh, sustainability, not just about being slightly more sustainable using 10% less plastic or something, but what does it actually mean to be able to perpetuate our species? And what does it mean to, mean to keep our ecosystem together and vital? Um, and, and to be able to make radical changes as we have already been making this year because of the pandemic. So um, I'm not gonna talk about that very much. I was actually, since I'm the first talk, talking more about intro stuff about AI. So uh, I, I, I came into AI ethics because of this. I was on a project that looked like it was a person and it's not a person. There's, that's this kind mensch. It's because my French is so bad. Um, so, uh, but anyway, the, the, the point is that a lot of people want to believe that they have ethical obligation to a robot if it's shaped like a person. Now in this particular lab at this time, this robot did not work at all. It turned out it wasn't properly grounded. The, the different boards of its brain could not communicate to each other. And yet people thought they had ethical obligation to this robot, whereas there are other robots that did work, but they happened to be shaped like insects and nobody cared about those, right? So our ethical intuitions are not the things that we can use to figure out what we're doing in this new world, all right? So I'm skipping through that quickly. So what am I even talking about when I talk about intelligence? This is an old, old definition. Yes, there are many others too, but just, just this one is from the 1800s when people were first trying to understand which animals were intelligent, more intelligent than each other. And it's just like being able to do the appropriate action in the context. Okay, by that definition, yes, thermostats are intelligent as was kicking around 20, you know, the 20th century, that's you know, the Chinese room argument, these, these weird uh, things that have kicked around. But um, when you understand that what you're talking about is transforming the present context into an action, then you know you're talking about computation. Computation is not magic, it's a physical process. It takes time, space, and energy. And, I, and again, 
talking about sustainability, we're just starting to get public awareness of the fact that search engines take energy, that, 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 you know, that, that machine learning takes energy, but it also takes physical space. And again, in the context of Europe, thinking about how Europe is controlling these situations, we need to remember, we do not have the infrastructure. We don't have the infrastructural capacities that Google has. I'm not talking about countries now. Google makes its own chips because it found, found that was necessary for cybersecurity. Europe does not make its own chips, okay? You know, and Europe and, and Google has its own fiber optic cable wrapping the world, kind of like how Europe has its own GPS. You know, sure, we could have borrowed America's and China's, but we chose to go and said, oh, let's have a little redundancy. It's good for security. It's good for the world. It's not only good for Europe that there's more than one airline company, that there's more than one GPS. Well, anyway, so similarly, infrastructure, Europe. Anyway, most people don't mean that. They think, oh, but what if it becomes an agent? And again, what does that mean? If you're Donald Davidson, it's a big deal, but there's, there's things like chemical agents. The thing that we need to agree about is that we're talking about moral agency. We're talking about who is it that's actually responsible for the artifacts. And that's why the focus, I hope this will be the focus of the white paper, but it sounds pretty good, is that Europe will start focusing on the fact that AI does, it's not AI that needs to be responsible. It's humans and human agencies that are, that are responsible um, the AI has to be transparent. We need to be able to trace the responsibility through the technologies and indeed the governments, all the complicated things we need. We need to be able to hold each other accountable because we are the only ones we're able to really motivate. Okay. So I'm sorry if I'm talking too fast. I know I've only got a few minutes. I, the, the, the two things that we care a lot about is not only moral agency, but also moral patience. But I'm going to skip over these slides because um, I'm not really here to talk about ethics. I, I'm here to talk about the EU. So um, four years ago, yeah, Jeff Hinton said we wouldn't need, so I'm sorry, this is a launch into, this is about future of work, <laughs> okay? Four years ago, Jeff Hinton said that we didn't need as many uh, human radiologists uh, anymore. We, don't, we already had enough um, because clearly deep learning was already doing a better job than they were. What's actually happened, yeah, he's, yeah he said that, that, uh, that radiologists were the coyote that, that, that had already gone off the cliff and didn't know it. Um, but the, what's actually happened in the intervening years is that there's more radiologists. It makes more sense to employ a radiologist now because with AI, they can actually do more, right? So they're actually more value. They actually get paid a little bit more, but they're producing uh, disproportionately more value than what they're getting paid more, right? So AI is actually making radiologists more valuable and there's more of them. Um, so, so the employment is not as easy, uh, the employment issue is not as easy as people think. If we go off and make software that makes, and, and I want you to think of both of these, key, these cases. I originally wrote this uh, to be about teachers and to think about how governments spend money, but it's even more interesting when we think about artists. So I was talking to some filmmakers in, in Germany and they're all like, oh yeah, indie film. Okay, great. So I write software and I make, I double your efficacy, all right? Does that mean we have twice as good of schools or movies or does that mean we have half as many teachers or, or, or film producers, right? That, that, that's nothing to do with technology. That is normative, that's about policy. And we need to remember that, and I, I, from my very first AI papers back in the, in AI ethics papers back in the 90s, the whole point is to remember it's an artifact. These are the problems we have over and over and over again. All right, so yeah, the, the, there are issues, of course, if we make the decisions, we reduce the number of people jobs in that particular school. Now, what we've actually seen, and I am, how am I doing for time actually? How much time do I have left? Where's my chair? I don't know where my chair is. Okay, I'm gonna assume seven, that I don't have that seven much minutes. time. Sorry? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Oh, okay, whoa, I, I must be talking too fast. Sorry about that. Okay, so, uh, so that I'm doing okay, but I will keep talking about this. Um, the, well, actually I have another slide about that though. Let me go to the other slide, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry, I have to leave this slide. That's okay. I'll come back to that slide. This is the slide I wanna talk about right now, but the other slide is super important. Um, what I just said about the teachers, right? <laughs> Um, th that we are having yeah, this, this is the slide I wanna show you, that there's more bank tellers now than we've ever had, even though there's fewer tellers per branch. 
Why? Because that made the branches cheaper. Okay. So, so, so AI is allowing us, and again, this is a very simple kind of AI, the automated teller machine, right? It's allowing us to employ more bank tellers, but it's reducing the number of branch managers. And that's why this is in, in that order that you just saw. So let me come back to this slide. So one of the things people say, well, how do we keep our wages high? Uh, let's, let's join unions and unions matter a lot. I don't wanna undermine that. The black line up here is American wages is specifically in the kinds of jobs that you would think uh, you could automate, you know, the, these, re these repeatable task things, right? Um, and if you're in a union, then, uh, then your wages are a little bit defended. But what's interesting to me about this slide, that, that matters, I'm in a, I'm, I think I'm still in the teaching union in Britain, um, but, but I, uh, what's more interesting to me is why is the decline of wages of the non-unionized labor all between 1983 and 1995? And so I asked the author, I shouldn't keep embarrassing him by telling you this, this story, but I, I asked the author when he, was, when he showed this talk and he said, oh, our theory is that actually there hasn't been a real AI built since 1995. <laughs> I'm like, I think your theory is wrong, okay? <laughs> so that, that, that can't be it. But what it does seem to be is that that was the period when uh, the, the, speaking of David Otter, that was when the American markets opened to Chinese competition. So suddenly there was a whole lot of new people that were uh, the, a new supply of people that reduced the value of their labor. And the same thing happened in Germany 10 years later. And this was because, so the, the wage decline happened in the 90s in, in Germany and also a weakening of the unions a little bit. They're pretty strong here. It's a great place actually. But they, they, they agreed to go to localized and subnationalized uh, bargaining. Why? Because the wall came down. The Iron Curtain collapsed, and suddenly there was competition next door from people with the same kinds of education. So it isn't AI that takes the jobs directly, but it could be AI that makes it so that more people can compete, all right? And when more people are competing, then wages go down unless someone figures out what they're doing with the economy, okay? And so I think when we're really talking about sustainability, we have to be thinking big. What is the economy? What are we really thinking about? Um, when, when, what, what, what are, what is the, what are the wages doing for us? Well, it matters. Security still matters. We need enough people that we can defend our borders. Cybersecurity matters now. Um, but, but we also need societies that are connected, and we just need to value human life. So I think there's a huge, huge issue here also. Um, in the humanities, because we are coming to understand ourselves better and better, and we're demystifying a lot of things. How does it feel to be a part of that? And how do we make jobs that, um, that people don't call, uh, I'm sorry for the rude word, but there was literally a book called Bullshit Jobs, right? You know, well, to some extent, a lot of jobs are, are bullshit. You're only there to make someone feel good, but, but that's great. Feeling good is really important. And, we have, and, and creating, formalizing uh, interconnectedness between people is important too. Of course, we want the best payload off of that we can get. But anyway, so this is really thinking about the future. I, I was just in an argument with somebody, uh, and, and it, apparently this is going to come out. But anyway, the, saying that Europe, all it does is it markets philosophy, and you can't, you know, you wouldn't, we're, we're going to starve, that we're destroying ourselves. And this is going to tie into the slides I really want to show you to wrap up my intervention here. Um, that Europe was destroying itself and that, you know, China and America were in this, this, this new Cold War and that was where all the action was and we were just peddling philosophy. Listen, the EU alone, the Eurozone alone, is one of the top three economies in the world. And, and yes, philosophy is part of that. We do actually market philosophy and our culture, right? But it's not the whole thing. There's also manufactured artifacts. There's also uh, uh, weapons. There's also... Um, uh, services, there's all kinds, we are a strong and vital region and we need to understand that. So I just wanna skip ahead, sorry to keep doing the skipping around thing. Um, but these are the new, uh, this is fake news. Uh, <laughs> this is something that motivated a bit of research. Uh, this is one of these talks where, um, so the, the, I should say, you see Holger Schmidt, uh, uh, Schmidt's name here. This is not the slide he wrote. Uh, so it's taking his data to look at the market cap of big companies and then kind of clustering them by global region and saying, look, Europe should be worried, all right? 
So, so there's a lot of problems here. That Europe is part, one of our strengths is that it is through diversity, it is through SMEs, right? And so if you're only going to look at the largest companies, then of course we're not going to look that big because we have a real a well-regulated space. So um, uh, with a collaborator, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, this is a little fuzzy. I, I don't know what went wrong with it, but you can, you can download it. I'll, I'll put it into the chat later. This is, uh, we, we've published this now uh, through CERN has a, a way to publish uh, slides and data sets. So we're doing that. It's a published data set and a published slide. Um, but what we said is let's, let's take a more objective measure. And this objective measure is the 2017 WIPO, not 2017, 2019, um, uh, the WIPO uh, patent database for AI. So we didn't even argue, you know, hearing me, I, I have a very broad idea of AI, but this is just what WIPO considers to be AI patents. And so every company that had at least two patents in 2019, interestingly, SAP didn't. So SAP would totally change uh, these figures. So looking at the left of this, on the bottom, we have market cap uh, in a log scale um, uh, and, uh, and on the x-axis. And then the y-axis, we have a number of patents. Notice we threw Huawei and Robert Bosch up there um, because they, they're not public, they don't have a market cap, but, but so we just kind of cheated and put them on the, uh, on the, on the axis there um, with stars. But anyway, I, I Look, look at this graph. I mean, there, I think in one of the, it's a graph of uh, patents against market cap. And one of the things I think I showed you is that both of those are ridiculous measures, right? Because we know Apple has tons of AI. We know Facebook has tons of AI, but they don't choose to protect it through the patent mechanism, right? And we also can see that different countries and regions have different attitudes about how they allow uh, a company to get large enough, except for America, but most countries, it's like one, one or two companies that have enough market caps so that they can do these acquisitions. So again, it's strategic. You can see look, China, two companies, they're almost the same market cap, almost the same uh, number of patents, coincidence, right? You know, and, and yet that's the thing that, now let's look at this graph on the right. The, the point here is that we actually have, if not the patents are a good measure, but even though they're not something that is good for defending a small company IP, we still have uh, more than China in the European, uh, this is the EEA. Notice we carefully left out Switzerland and Britain. Um, so people that were affected by the GDPR. But look at the China. rest of the world. You know, the rest of the world is fine. And the idea that, that we need, that, that, China, that uh, the USA needs our support against China is bizarre. Okay, so I will, I will pull out. I guess I must have just hit the time. So I will pull out of this and just say, thank you. Here's my thank you slide. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joanna, for giving us this uh, bigger picture. Um, I would like to maybe ask you one follow-up question. And if you would allow me, I would like to sure, uh, make, make a reference to to a recent work, a recent paper on the sustainability game. Oh yeah. So it, it really triggered me. Uh, I, I would like to see if, if you could maybe like give a very short uh, explanation and, and maybe if you could uh, sketch to see what the plans here would be because could we bring this for instance to stakeholder workshops to those future workshops like UNESCO is putting forward? Uh, can it be used by different categories of stakeholders? But uh, yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, sure. No, I would love to talk about that. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm not thinking, should I throw up my slides on this? So the sustainability game, the point was that we were trying to communicate the idea of public goods, including even when I go and talk to Google, you know, people like that. It's just like understanding that European regulation is a win-win thing that has actually benefited uh, all of our economies, like the GDPR. It, yes, it, it, it protected us, but also benefited uh, business. So, um, I, I uh, let's see, where are we? Okay, sorry, <laughs> just, it's just fl stuff flashing around. Um, I, I, so we, we thought, how do we communicate this idea about public goods to people? And so we created, a, it's called a God's Eye computer game um, where, so it's quite, it's based on an agent-based model. Uh, and so agent-based model uh, that, that's, 
uh, it's it's naturalistic and that there's space, there's food that you grow. And so you have to figure out how to how to live within your ecosystem. Now, we could have called this the existential game, too, because you have to pick your own goal. Your goals can be like, you know, the, the longest uh, average lifespan of the people in your in your simulation, or it could be uh, the, 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 the least number, of, you know, the lowest infant mortality, or it could be just the this longest persistence of the civilization you create. But the basic idea is that um, you get to uh, uh, manipulate the priorities of, of agents uh, towards whether they, they only take care. If you don't take care of yourself, they all starve and that's over. So they have to take care of themselves some and they have to uh, take care of their families, but they, they can, if they choose to, invest more or less time in their family and more or less time in public goods like bridges that get them access to more food. So it's, it's this fun game. And we had this uh, great idea that if we let people play it, then um, maybe they would better understand how to uh, cooperate and the, and the value of cooperation is measured through uh, behavioral economic schemes. So the, the funny thing about it, and we do have a paper published about this, is that the, uh, um, unfortunately, we ran it with uh, some Princeton psychologists uh, instead of economists, and they, they let the people see who they were playing against. And so I found out about halfway through. So half the data is uh, person on person in, in, two, in two continents, in Britain and America. Uh, and half of the data is four people in the room. And so the four people don't know who they're playing against. And that's the way economists like to run these games. So you don't, you don't have a, a personal thing. So when two people know who they, they've been playing the game uh, and, they, and they know who they're playing against, then they actually get uh, more instrumental and start manipulating each other. And they, they actually destroy the public goods. But if they don't know who they're playing, <laughs> Then they, uh, that, what, that, what, that was actually already a known thing in the economics literature, which is why it was ridiculous to run it. We, we know that people get competitive in those contexts. Um, but if they don't know who they're playing against, then yes, indeed, they were much more able to achieve these, uh, these uh, the, this equilibrium, so the, the, the positive, the, to, to get more benefit out of it. So, um, and, and that was done in control against somebody just playing some other computer game. I think it was, what's the one where they're, they're, the things are falling from the sky and you're flipping stuff over? Tetris. So it's like Tetris versus this, the sustainability game. So mm -hmm. we had hoped, you know, of course, when you're first writing something, you're thinking, oh, and then, you know, first we'll do a bunch of science and then we'll release it and we'll save the world and everybody will be, you know, a happier place. So we, we actually uh, uh, ran out of funding you know, on the whole thing and we haven't run as many experiments as we want. We, we were slightly roadblocked because of that contradictory response in the publication. So that project is still sort of ongoing, but if anyone, I, I, if you're interested, I'm totally happy, especially, you know, we, it wouldn't be that hard to, we, we have all the software, everything's there. Uh, and it would be fun to bring it into uh, these contexts where we could get people playing it. And then, and then if they would let us, we could run experiments on them afterwards. <laughs> Great. But, uh, yeah. Sure Thank you very much for uh, for giving some more explanation on that and sure. we could follow up on it. Um, thank you very much. I would now like to give uh, the floor uh, to Andrea. Uh, Andrea, I will start. I will stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing yours if you'd like to. Thank you. Thank the floor you. Is yours. Thank you. All right. Let me see. Okay, so you can see what's really important uh, that is going on <laughs> on my screen. It was the, the results of the US election that everybody's waiting for. So um, thank you. And uh, it's good to, to have listened to uh, Joanna's uh, uh, very interesting speech. Uh, I am, uh, uh, I'm going to reflect a little bit on, uh, on, on a number of uh, issues related to uh, first of all, where we are now uh, with the with digital technology and um, how do we craft rules that are future proof and somehow represent the totality of the challenges that we face when it comes to integrating and embedding digital technology in our society. And uh, for me, the, the key issue uh, uh, is they're realizing that uh, despite the fact that we are uh, clearly uh, living um, and unusual times and uh, uh, a very unexpected, at least for most of us, uh, situation. Uh, we shouldn't uh, look back uh, at, uh, at the world in 2019 as if there were a state of grace to get back to. Uh, and it is important to realize that uh, when, it, when we talk about sustainability, uh, I don't think we need to talk only about environmental sustainability, obviously, but we need to talk about sustainability from an economic, social, and environmental perspective. And if you look at the first, let's say, 20, 
five years of the life of the commercial internet, it's, um, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to conclude that this has led us on a sustainable path. Uh, Andrea, indeed, I, Andrea, I'm yes. sorry to disturb you. We're not seeing, I'm seeing a fully black screen. Ah, yeah, no, this is on purpose. Yeah, oh, that's on purpose. Yeah, yeah, sorry it's on for purpose. that. I'm going to get I'm there ruining, in one minute. Yeah. yeah, no, don't worry. It's, <laughs> I'm uh, ruining the surprise. It's then for now. you to sort of sorry space for that. out. For you to space out a little bit and, uh, and I will continue to space out screen. sorry yeah, exactly uh, so we are not in a, in a particular I see Alyosha for, for example is wearing a, a black uh, sweater so he is into that mood uh, and not nothing no political comments in there I mean no references to what is happening in the US or stuff like this but uh, um, I'm just saying you know think think about the fact that what has happened until now has led us into a situation in which, be that for uh, market concentration uh, in, in several sectors, uh, the concentration of market power in the hands of very few companies, uh, be that because of the increased, uh, increased uh, growing precarity of jobs uh, and uh, the polarization of the job market, be that also because of the energy consumption of some uh, uh, AI techniques or even uh, other digital technologies, such as the mining activities, for example, in, uh, in the fully um, uh, uh, decentralized and uh, permissionless uh, uh, blockchains. Uh, I mean, and all this uh, has given us a situation in which we have been taking digital technology as something completely separate from our quest for sustainability. And in some cases, as an answer to sustainability and as a solution to sustainability, but in some cases, it's also a problem. And as always, the difficulty is that uh, uh, we have this general purpose technologies that are at once uh, uh, potentially solutions, but also they are chiefly problems. So the key issue there will be starting to internalize the externalities, right? So the fact that uh, a specific technique costs uh, quite a lot to, in terms of energy, for example, or has a, a rather terrible environmental footprint or comes with very un unsustainable uh, dynamics in the labor market should be taken into account before we decide whether we want to have that as a means to an end, so as a, as a way to get to a future vision of society, as opposed to, uh, for example, being obsessed with, uh, I don't know, leadership in AI, just because we think that that should be the end state or should be the goal of any government. So for me, that is very complicated, because if you think, and uh, we get out of the, of the black screen, if you think about uh, how we deal with those issues, especially when it comes to public policy, uh, often we are observing what is already there and trying to catch up with it. So for example, the internet as we know it today. So uh, uh, this is very similar to what Zeno, an ancient philosopher, pre-Socratic, said about the paradox of motion, right? If Achilles wants to reach a tortoise and jumps where the tortoise is, uh, the tortoise will have made uh, a another step from T1 from to T2. So the policy by getting to A2 will not really reach the tortoise. And th this goes on and on forever uh, in the paradox of motion so that Achilles never reaches the tortoise. Now, in the situation in which we are now, we're in a different situation. Technology runs faster. And the law uh, cannot really try to catch up with technology. And uh, I, my current experience, for example, after the, the experience in the high level expert group on AI, uh, I'm now assisting the, the European Commission in the impact assessment of the forthcoming AI regulation. If we take AI as it is now uh, and craft rules that we know will, will enter into force maybe in 2023 uh, or in 2022, we already know that those rules are probably largely gonna be an unfit for purpose by the time they get there. And uh, this this is something that I've lived on my own, my own experience uh, also as a, as a scholar, meaning uh, I've tried to uh, build images and uh, scenarios for the future, even through narrative and through fiction uh, in a way that would help me figure out how the world in the future and how our data intensive society would look like. So for example, a couple of years ago, I started writing a story, which in my opinion would become a fantastic paper. It's never become a paper. Uh, and the story of a guy named Ben, and this guy discovers at some point that he only has six months left to live, is terminally ill. And uh, a company approaches Ben and asks him to um, basically for free, share all the data that is uh, uh, produced and, and stored on social, social media, all the other data that is produced over time, maybe share through a long interview his political opinions. Uh, uh, maybe the company would also interview his friends and his relatives so that when Ben will pass away, uh, um, the company will create a, a, a replica of Ben, maybe by using uh, the same technologies that are used today for deep fakes, you know, for example, generative adversarial networks. And, uh, and that then would then replace the actual band and then will continue to evolve over time. Maybe 
it, it, it will change his political opinions. And maybe it will be able to advise his relatives, his uh, son and daughter, wife, uh, about what to vote in the next election. He will be able to scrape data from social networks and congratulate maybe a nephew for having had a baby. Uh, I mean, and the more uh, people will go on and interacting with Ben in what today we would call in this niche market that is expanding a grief bot. Um, ben would be, you know, with the, the company that manages Ben would increasingly have an incentive to nudge people towards certain choices and not others. And so the key issue here does not become whether people would interact with somebody who's uh, uh, alive or who's already dead. The issue here would be uh, whether the people that interact with Ben will be able to trust whether uh, Ben is saying something that is result, the result of a sophisticated AI technology or is there is something in the design in the data they're inputted and in the way in which the output is organized that uh, uh, makes Ben less trustworthy or maybe more malicious, if you wish, in the way it, Ben, uh, 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 let's say, uh, formulates its output and advice to his relatives and friends. Now, that it was something that really was making me feel quite creative when I was doing this. Then I discovered that uh, uh, Black Mirror already was developing a sort of a similar thing in an episode uh, called Be Right Back. And then I discovered that uh, this thing, although in a chatbot environment that had already been developed uh, in Russia when Roman Mazurenko, famous influencer, uh, uh, died a few years ago, uh, he was transformed into a chatbot with supposedly with his own personality. But obviously the technology that we have today and the technology that we will have in three, four years from now is much more immersive in this respect, in terms of the uh, of our relationship with something that is not real. So I, I'll drop the, the, the Ben story, if you wish, but the, I got into the, the issue of what happens in a world in which the reality around us is something that we have to decide whether it's real, whether it's fake, whether it's uh, manipulated or not. Uh, I, I was quite uh, moved by uh, er, the, the documentary that was shown earlier this year by the South Korean uh, broadcaster uh, on a mom celebrating the seventh birthday of her daughter that had passed away three years before when she was four. And the daughter had been aged just like Ben could be. And the mother was really in such an, a, a confusing environment that she didn't know where to to laugh or whether to cry or whether it was real or whether it was not. And uh, I think it's a good anticipation of a world in which we have 1 trillion connected devices, maybe in 15 years from now, and all those devices produce data that are around us like a fifth element. And we need to decide whether in all this data that are produced, what we, where we, do we place our trust, right? And other things like the, the deep fakes, obviously, uh, uh, that are being used today that make it increasingly difficult to, to uh, distinguish what's real from what's fake. It, it, it's, uh, it's a first anticipation of this. So when we craft rules for AI, the internet of things and the big data uh, and increasingly big data, we need to think about that. We need to think about what's going to happen in three, four, five years from now in the age that we might call for now extended reality. And how is this going to be something that we can manage if we haven't been fully managed in the first 25 years, let's say, of the, the fully networked economy uh, to really get to any sustainable solution or trustworthy solution. Uh, that said, we also know that the deepfakes are not the only thing that uh, is different from what it appears with uh, uh, my, my friends in Berkeley have uh, um, carried out research on the so-called checkout free stores, uh, the illusion of full automation, right? You get in, you get out, you have paid, and you have noticed, and uh, you only uh, have you know, the, the, the convenience of picking up the, the things that you need. You don't need to talk to anyone. You don't need to stop any, at, at any counter to pay. Um, to discover that there is uh, maybe, I don't know if they disqualify for Joanna's BS jobs, as she mentioned them before, but uh, that there's a lot of people that uh, are on a day-by-day -day basis uh, uh, hired in other parts of the world, in this case in Madagascar, to, to, manually, to manually correct what the AI gets wrong and just to enable the, the company to give this illusion of full automation. And the irony of this is also that many of these people are training a machine that maybe one day will be so accurate that they will be able to do without them. So they are actually digging uh, uh, from an employment perspective their own graves. And finally, we also discovered that the data uh, is obvious once, once it comes out can, can be used in several different ways. And so we've discovered also the, the problem of uh, placing our trust not only in private corporations, but also in governments in many, in many respects. So 
My first conclusion, um, I approach hopefully halfway in my in my presentation, is that uh, the people that tell you the data is a new oil, if you even if you believe that oil is a good thing, uh, it's been a curse for many countries, obviously, uh, are probably uh, um, are probably wrong. Maybe for the future, it is actually trust, uh, the ability to trust the data flows, um, regardless of whether data are small or big, that would be the real issue. And how do we make it happen in public policy? Well, in my opinion, there are a number of ingredients that are trying to very quickly um, uh, uh, line up now in the forthcoming regulatory environments uh, that uh, uh, should help us re rediscover trust, but also at the same time, effectively accompany this technological development, ensuring that we jump ahead of the tortoise or Achilles, depending on the example uh, that I made before, uh, rather than uh, uh, being reactive only to this development. So the first one is having a little bit of foresight. We are seeing this at the European Union level, the attempt and the big bet. Uh, I don't know what my uh, fellow panelists think about this, but a big bet in the European Commission today is imagining a, an upcoming development in which uh, uh, rather than having most of the data stored in the cloud, we will have most of the data stored in, uh, closer to the devices, right? In so-called edge layer or in the devices. And this creates a situation in which uh, the incentives for the European Union in particular are different uh, because there is a new space that could potentially be conquered. Uh, and also relating to what Joanna was, uh, was uh, showing before in terms of the potential global competition. Uh, so one thing that the EU has put together in terms of what, uh, what is the, the forthcoming agenda is there might be a possibility of leading the world in ethical AI because we don't see a spontaneous development uh, uh, in other parts of the world towards ethical AI. We don't see that in Europe either, but there is a space to conquer there due to the ability of the EU to, to craft uh, and, uh, and solid legal rules. There's a need to, to build back more economic and social sustainability in particular in, uh, in the business to consumer uh, part of the digital economy, but there is a space for competing in the business to business and in the government to citizen, to citizen segments, and in particular to compete in those uses of AI that are a function of sustainability. Uh, and so that is something that is happening uh, to some extent at EU level, I would want it to happen even more. The second element that I would want to see is principles-based regulation even more. Uh, an example of what uh, Raja and I, among others, have done uh, in the high-level expert group is the definition of principles of trustworthy AI and the conversion of those principles into requirements that are now potentially being further translated into regulation. And, uh, and that is uh, uh, inevitable because the principles are not supposed to change over time uh, uh, constantly, uh, but their operationalization is supposed to change and we're gonna have to need governance for that. The other, uh, on the other end uh, from the principles is the outcome-based regulation that is equally important. Again, technology is not uh, um, a good per se, and I actually, myself, uh, um, I, I don't necessarily care about artificial intelligence unless uh, artificial intelligence can help us realize a vision for the medium term and the long term that is sustainable. And thereby all the discussion on, for example, energy consumption or the discussion on sustainable development goal eight, uh, uh, decent work and economic growth, uh, and in particular, the sub indicators on full and decent employment for everybody. These are uh, where we that where AI can lead us, but where also AI can uh, can also uh, lead us completely away from. So uh, we need to make sure that we use those digital technologies in a way that help us achieve these goals, rather than take them as ends in and of themselves. The other thing that it will be important in uh, crafting a proportionate uh, public policy approach to these technologies is to be proportionate to the risk. Uh, but understanding how the risk evolves over time in an interactive environment in which data are, uh, is produced by countless AI systems and their interaction between themselves and with human beings is a, is a prohibitively difficult uh, uh, issue. We need to make sure that we get ready there by coming up with agile governance uh, uh, um, uh, arrangements. So agility and, uh, and also when we talk about setting up agencies or boards or for to regulate digital technology is something that will have to be uh, carefully taken into account. And finally, we cannot do this alone, meaning that uh, we, uh, uh, any public policy framework that is about the, the ability to trust technology has to be, needs to be based on shared value. So echoing the presence of Raja in the panel, I think one good scenario there would be the ability, for example, to develop the, further the global partnership on, on AI. But I see, depending also on what happens in the US uh, these days, um, the, mm, a potential trend towards a smaller uh, trust network of like-minded countries only 
uh, that potentially polarizes the, the, the evolution of uh, the approaches to, to the governance of digital technologies, perhaps even leading to a fragmentation, which is totally undesirable, what is called splinternet in, in some parts of the literature. So to wrap up in, in, uh, uh, in where we are and when I think we are heading uh, and, and leave uh, 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 Natalie with, uh, with uh, maybe uh, some, a few minutes for, for the other panelists, which is obviously uh, uh, would be polite on my end. Uh, I think what we've seen are, are a first, uh, um, say, generation of the internet in the early days where um, computer scientists, uh, telecommunication experts were really portraying the internet as, a, as a, a layered environment with a physical infrastructure, traffic rules, if you wish, the logical layer, and then application and content. After 25 years, we are in a situation in which the middle layer has been largely captured by uh, the platforms um, that have uh, also exploited the centripetal forces or the network externalities on the internet by capturing most of the, of the value and making this overall uh, um, uh, environment uh, rather economically unsustainable and socially unsustainable. We are now in a different situation where we need to build a new environment that is not trustworthy. In my opinion, and I'll do this very quickly, this is made of different forms of connectivity, not only 5G, uh, but depending on the needs, there will be different protocols that emerge. Uh, a potentially cloud, a federated cloud that is different from having one single giant, but having rules embedded in code and, uh, and the possibility uh, also for many players to compete on a relatively equal footing, which is a big bet of Gaia X. So let's see whether this happens or not. A, a very fat bottom layer with the Internet of Things and the edge uh, infrastructure. Uh, they will be uh, uh, developing quite quickly with all the problems uh, of uh, security that this entails. And well, Joanna can talk about this for days, uh, so I will not uh, uh, abuse my space here. Then they will have increasingly um, digital authentication and verification layers, but also legal rules uh, um, embedded in, the, in this intermediate layer so that whoever operates on the basis of this uh, infrastructure does it uh, with uh, compliance with the essential principles and uh, potentially uh, securing uh, or promoting the achievement of specific outcomes. And then we will have the data spaces, which is the, 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 the big element that I haven't had the time to cover, which is the data strategy of the European Commission. Three of them horizontal, others sectoral, uh, so that on top of them, we will end up not having a common open internet, but we will have perhaps managed sectoral data spaces. The open internet as we knew it before, um, uh, plus the other, say, end-to-end -end, uh, uh, architectures, including DLTs, uh, distributed ledger technologies, digital platforms as they have already emerged in the B2C, but also big uh, space for digital government, uh, which is also part uh, or a, spe a special case of the data spaces. We're still going to need end users with skills, hopefully on top of them. And we will have two horizontal development, which is one, uh, the artificial intelligence, which is not a layer. It's basically everywhere. And we also need to have protocols for user control over data in all this. Now, is this possible? And is this, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a scary uh, uh, portrait of uh, um, how can we build a different architecture of the internet to have a chance of uh, uh, mm, sort of preserving trust in what we see, what we touch, what we do? Uh, that's my open question for the end. So I'm sorry to have to raise at this stage more questions than the answers I'm able to give, but this is, I think, the evolution that I see happening. And I'll stop there with another black screen and stop sharing. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, thank you for um, sharing with us all the speaking examples of social impact, of societal impact, uh, the societal collective harms that uh, could, call, could, call, could be caused uh, by them. Uh, maybe one short follow-up question, um, building on a question that was uh, put on the WUVA. So it, uh, it concerns the dynamic nature of uh, societal expectations, uh, also relating to the difficulties to measure the societal impact, to measure societal harms, to discover them actually. So they, the question is um, targeting the institutionalization of control, of screenings, of inspections. So you, you mentioned it when we were talking about agility and on the... Um, setup maybe of boards uh, could you could you maybe elaborate a bit more on that uh, like what could be I, I know it's maybe early days to say uh, like I don't know well, whether we are ready <laughs> but um, probably not. maybe your yeah. comment on that 
Yeah, I mean, I can share what I am um, uh, currently working on, which is the, regu the AI uh, regulation uh, uh, that is being prepared by the European Commission. So it's the European Commission that is working on it. And I'm assisting uh, in particular through the cost assessment, but also mapping the impacts of AI on fundamental rights and on safety. Now, one of the uh, ways in which you can control uh, potentially high risk AI products that emerge in society and are circulated in society is to um, uh, sort of stop them before they reach the market, right? That would be the intuitive way. So um, you uh, uh, basically take a, an AI solution, uh, you run a conformity assessment, you run some uh, lab tests, you see whether potentially it raises certain risks for safety or for fundamental rights. If the risks are unacceptable, there are no mitigating measures, they are stopped before they reach the market. Well, sounds easy, but the problem is, uh, first of all, uh, most of the risks generated by AI solutions are not necessarily visible at the moment in which these AI solutions are designed, uh, meaning the risks might emerge at the later stage when one decides oh, uh, how to deploy a specific solution uh, and in a specific context, and depending on the on the data around that that you use, but also on the surrounding environment, meaning uh, is this AI solution going to interact with other AI solutions in the spirit of flash crashes, or is the AI solution going to interact with humans? Uh, some people remember the, the famous uh, uh, chatbot Thai that in 2016 was deployed by Microsoft and, and then started sucking up all the bad, um, uh, say, or the, the belly of the world that you find on, twi on the Twitter sphere, uh, so that it had to be withdrawn basically from the Twitter sphere because it had become fascist and racist very quickly. Um, so, what happens on the ground is perhaps very different uh, in most cases from what happens in the lab. So, you cannot do a lot of ex ante controls. You cannot necessarily target the developers only, but you have to target the deployers of the AI system. How do you allocate responsibility? And then what happens next if the system is a continuously learning system and who's going to monitor uh, the risks and who's going to evaluate the risks ex exposed? What kind of responsibility should we give to the different uh, uh, developers, deployers, and so on and so forth? It's uh, a different world in which we don't have the example and the exposed, but we live in a constant state of monitoring, if you wish, that require that we, we don't use, I don't know, conformity assessment bodies. We require It requires that we use maybe secure data exchanges, where the ones that deploy AI systems automatically share data with regulatory authorities uh, that can observe then in real time what's going on and whether this goes out of uh, specific parameters of risk. Now, uh, this is completely different in terms of regulatory style and approach. Um, now, I don't know what's going to happen with the AI regulatory requirement. I really don't think we're going to get to any online real-time uh, monitoring at this stage, but certainly the people that work on standards are already working on this because the acceleration of the technology um, will um, uh, uh, force us to accelerate and, and, and become more agile also in the way we accompany the development of the technology. Yes, to, thank you, Andrea. You, yes, sorry, I, I wasn't, and I, I didn't unmute myself. Sorry for that. Um, so, Joanna, you wanted to intervene? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I can't seem to get my uh, video going uh, uh, because I don't have permission, but I, I can still talk, right? So, uh, oh, yeah, I can start. Uh, Sina, it. Sina, but can you switch Joanna's consent. video back yeah. on? Now I have to consent. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> so that that's good. But, you know, Zoom Zoom got hammered. They said. In fact, uh, that there's a great quote of the CTO going, I, I wish we thought about ethics earlier in this process, but, 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 but that now they're doing it, you know? Uh, but yes, please do start there. Um, I wanted to come back to the Tay thing just because it's, uh, it's such a great illustration of something. So that the, the Microsoft Tay had been um, working, in fact, the exact same algorithm is still, to my knowledge, a quite a popular program in Asia. And the, the thing that went wrong was that um, it, it's set up, and we know there's so many ways for this to go wrong, it's set up to maximize interactions. And in Asia, if you say something uh, socially unacceptable, you're shunned. And in America, if you say something socially unacceptable, you're mobbed, <laughs> okay? So these are two, I mean, you could talk about non-human primates and you can see these two different strategies of social uh, maintenance, but it just, the, the same algorithm does not work the same way in two different so societies and cultures. Uh, but of course, you know, as we know that this, I don't know, to the, still the extent, but we seem to know that this is why uh, um, YouTube was driving uh, uh, attention to, Hillary, to uh, Donald Trump from Hillary Clinton, 
because people, you know, Hillary Clinton didn't lie that much. People did hate her. They mobbed her a bit, but no, seriously, there was like big stats and like, you know, it was massively, she just wasn't as controversial. And so there was more interaction with Trump. And so everything got driven to Trump because that was more interaction. It was longer persistence, more advertising money. And it wasn't actually a political decision, but it was a consequence of a monetizing strategy and a, and a, and a culture that would have been totally different had it been in Asia or at least China. I don't, I don't know if every, I don't wanna, I shouldn't generalize. Yeah, which shows you the importance of the context in which you deploy. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Would anyone else like to respond or react? You know, then uh, we will uh, continue uh, focusing more on uh, designing our technologies, um, keeping um, the societal acceptability um, in, in mind, taking it into consideration. Is it ethics that needs to be taken into consideration? I would like to ask the opinion and the views of uh, Professor Sabina Amon. Sabina, you have the floor. I will stop sharing. Sabine, could you unmute? You are still muted, You're, Sabine. you're still muted. No, no, it should work. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> yeah, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, I would like to invite you to imagine the year 2040. A skyscraper is burning in Berlin. So, and the situation is far too dangerous for human beings. An intelligent rescue robot goes into the building and picks up the inhabitants and brings them safely to the outside. And this rescue robot is a big success, but it continues learning on the job in Berlin and after, Another five years, it clearly shows that this rescue robot um, rescues certain persons more likely than others. So people with white skin are more likely to be rescued than people from other ethnographic um, ethnic ethnicities. So there is an outcry and the robot is turned racist, it was said, and it was dismissed immediately. So um, what has happened? So the Robert continued to learn on the job. And as he um, was working in Berlin, he trained on a biased data set. And by this, he improved to recognize much better people with white skin. But the behavior this uh, intelligence system showed clearly uh, contradicts with our core values. So treating people equally, regardless their ethnographic background. So how can we avoid such unwanted outcomes? And we say, so ethics needs to be a driver in AI and human machine interaction development and to bring in values as early as possible into the design processes. But there are at least two major challenges with this. This is the first challenge. So this is a graph by one of the leading market analysts, uh, Traktika, for new and emerging technologies. And they make a prediction for AI software revenues. And this graph is not only striking that you see an almost exponential growth, what is expected as revenues for the next five years. What is striking especially is the incredibly bandwidth of applications of these software applications. It is start from advertising, automotive, construction, education, financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, public sector, scientific research, and so on and so on. So the one solution for ethical AI and embedding values will be very unlikely. So there are a lot of different domains having an important impact. So this is the first challenge and this is the second one. This is a graph showing um, idealized um, development of new and emerging technologies such as AI technologies over time line. And in the course of the development, our knowledge is growing 
step by step about potential outcomes. And once the technology is widely developed and um, started to be used or already entrenched in society, we will know a lot about outcomes and also about maybe unwanted outcomes. But in contrast to this is the design and the options for design intervention with a green line. So in the early phases, we have a lot of opportunities to intervene and um, to interact, but the more the process continues, a lot of decisions are taken, paths are set in the design process. So we have less options to intervene. And in the late phases, it's very difficult to change anything. It becomes very costly or even impossible because the technology is already entrenched. So for methods and applications of technology assessment, the challenge is to intervene as early as possible. Because here we have the greatest impact. But as I said, and this is also called as addressed as the Colin Richard dilemma, we have only few knowledge about the outcomes. So what can we do in such a situation? We have a lot of potential to intervene, but not a lot of knowledge. So what we say, what we have in these early phases are visions about these technologies and visions how to use these technologies. And this is what we can work in in the early phases. So there are on a very general level visions out there. AI is the new electricity we already heard before. Data is the new oil. There are visions which we are all uh, shaped by in, in films or in literature. iRobot, for example, one of the blockbusters which all influence our imagination of the future. But there are also visions like the German government uh, strategy for artificial intelligence, which clearly said they want to embed AI in a broad societal dialogue and embed this development um, ethical values into this. So there are visions out there which shape the design process. And we also have visions on the project base. And this is where we want to intervene and uh, work with projects. So we take the early stages in, in, in research project at the moment, and then look at the visions out there. And um, this is um, an illustration of the V model. This is a widely used um, process model in technology development. And there are especially the early phases on the left-hand side and the other level where the concepts are made, where the requirements are defined. And there is the point to explicate the values and to investigate the visions in there and to ethically evaluate this and to develop design options on this basis. In an iterative process, this can be then accompanied by ethical testing throughout the whole process to bring in ethical issues in the product development. So the ethical vision design is a procedural approach which could be embedded in more classical um, approaches like the me model, but also more agile approaches embedding design thinking methods. And uh, the idea is to develop an ethics toolbox which can help to explicate visions and which supports the design of visions in this process and to help operationalizing values. And by this, the, um, we can generate best practice examples, which then can guide further developments. So this is a approach which is based on people bringing ethical expertise in the design process. It concentrates on processes and it's a project-based approach. So the Berlin, what the Berlin Ethics Lab aims at bringing together different expertise to do this. So on the one hand, an interdisciplinary knowledge integration, bringing together domain knowledge. And here we work, especially with computer science and engineering together with reflective knowledge of the humanities and social sciences. But this is not enough. We also need a societal deliberation to bring together also transformation knowledge and long-term perspectives in transdisciplinary knowledge integrations. So bringing stakeholders from startups and companies, politics, associations and institutions or NGOs and citizens into the design process. So let me to conclude return to the example I presented at the beginning. Let's go back to the um, rescue robot. 
So working with this vision, which I unfolded in the beginning, what can we do to avoid something? And when we start to think about this, then we can explore potential measures. So do we need strategies of fairness to be implemented in such a system? Does explainability help here? Can we program certain ethical rules into the systems? Or do we need a regular testing to avoid these unwanted outcomes? So we can now work with the visions here in an interdisciplinary collaboration, bringing together different perspectives. Dealing with these visions, they're still very um, concentrated on the technological approach. There's another layer of visions, which is more in a broader perspective. We can also ask the ideas or the metaphors within this vision uh, do we want an anthropomorphic system? So is it so is do we want something to have to replace a fireman for, or do we rather want to have a tool? So is it about to replace something or is it a, of tool use what we really want? And this are societal deliberations which are needed. And this needs to be done in a transdisciplinary collaboration. So these are far more broader questions on a more um, general level. And there's another, a third level of visions which are embedded in these scenarios. We can also start to go to the origin of the problem. What, what is it what we want to address? So we don't want um, burning houses or skyscrapers and we don't want to, people to die in a building. But what it is what we need? Is this a rescue robot or could we also change the building construction, for example? Do we need intelligent building modules which warn us right from the beginning of a fire outbreak and avoid that we would have such a big fire? So should we rather look at other areas for the solution of this? Or do we need different materials in construction works to avoid fire outbreaks? So this, once again, dealing with visions needs a thinking outside of the box, lateral thinking and also artistic practices can help here. So we can work with visions on different levels and then to gain knowledge about the future artifact or technology we are developing. And this is an iterative process in the design process. So there are elements of an analysis of these visions which come then by an uh, ethical intervention based on this analysis. And when we analyze this in an ethics assessment, then we can develop new design options, which then again, turn into a testing and uh, checking whether they work the way we want. So by this, using this iteratively, dealing with the visions and values embedded there in the design process, we can um, get a more ethical stance on the technology embedded into the technology. So coming to my conclusion, we all want to avoid such negative scenarios. And um, it is especially when we embed this in the early design processes, we can help to design responsible futures. And for sure we need a portfolio of different measures, but ethical vision design can be an uh, important contributor for responsible AI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabine. Thank you for giving us your insights in the design process. I would uh, propose that we immediately go uh, to Raja for your contribution. And then maybe Alyosha, we could check to see if there are questions that would mainly go to uh, Sabine and Raja and take them first. So Raja, you have the floor. Sabine, could you please yeah, stop sharing? Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me put my screen sharing. Yes. Can you see my slides? Yes. We do. Uh, so um, actually, Sabina's uh, talk is, uh, and the previous ones as well, actually, but Sabina specif specifically is a great uh, way for me to start because uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, actually dig a little bit inside the process she mentioned and uh, trying to address the issues of trust and transparency in, in AI systems. 
so as Sabina said, and I had this slide as well, but maybe less informed, I didn't put any figures in it. AI technology today is used in multiple sectors and this uptake in, in, in those sectors has happened very, very quickly, motivated by the availability of a technology uh, because uh, in a way it's uh, somewhat easier to develop than uh, other technology. It's, it's software development. And it is the case today that uh, uh, software development is using uh, libraries and software systems and databases that are available uh, or uh, either, either publicly available or available to specific industries, but uh, the data is there and the um, development process is fast. And I remind you about the I, uh, Achilles and the turtle uh, that was mentioned by uh, Andrea. Uh, and uh, so this uptake has happened actually in a way which is kind of, I would say risky. Risky because the technology uh, is not mature in all its dimensions. I can show you a technology, I can show you results, uh, convincing results, but uh, this doesn't mean that we have reached a level of maturity which is enough for clear adoption. Adoption of a technology is founded on trust. If you don't trust that the technology is going to work, that it is reliable, you are not going to use it. Uh, so there is a hype uh, tendency as well. Uh, trust is founded on safety. It means you, it's you're safe to use this technology. Of course, if you are in a domain where safety doesn't uh, have any, any consequence, that's fine. But uh, in general, and specifically in those uh, sectors I've mentioned, safety is important. And governance is also important because governance provides the framework within which we can trust this technology. So let me um, dig a little bit into these trust and governance issues. Uh, trust, uh, what the high-level expert group uh, with the European Commission called technical robustness and safety, it's, it's the second key requirement out of seven, is based on the idea that technologically speaking, the uh, system, the AI system must be safe and robust. And this leads us to a concept which is used in software engineering, software system engineering, very much in uh, industries that have a uh, strong impact on human safety, for example, aviation or car manufacturing, where you use computer systems. And depend this notion of dependability means that you have a system that uh, uh, deliver a service and this service delivery can justifiably be trusted and justifiably, of course, is the key issue here, that it means you can prove it. You can have means to assess that the uh, service is going to be delivered. And this is where trust in the service comes from. And uh, of course, I will not detail what dependability is. Uh, I've uh, put a, a reference down there. It's a paper uh, dating back to 204. Uh, but of course, this concept has evolved over time with uh, the issues of resilience, etc. But you see that it has different uh, various uh, features. Availability, the service should be always available. Uh, you cannot just try to use it and it's not uh, able to, to, to do the job. It should be reliable. It means it should be capable to work over time. It should be safe. It means it doesn't entail any uh, consequences that might be catastrophic in terms of, for example, human integrity. It must be confidential. It means that it has to be protected against uh, uh, people who, I mean, or, or, or use, which is not authorized. It must be integer, which means it, uh, no one can tamper with it. And it must be secure. It means that you have the means to protect it from any uh, tampering and, and any uh, breach but also that this is uh, uh, going to happen over time. It's always safe. 
So these have been studied over time. And I think this is a key requirement really for uh, uh, deploy deploying services that can be trusted. Uh, the second requirement is about governance. And I would like to focus on transparency here, which is a means for governance. Transparency is the fourth uh, key requirement that was put forward by the Hollywood Expert Group. And it has different components. Traceability, meaning traceability of the data that has been used. Uh, you uh, have to know where this data came from. Uh, traceability of the design, uh, specifically because uh, th there is a, a strong tendency to use uh, systems or components or libraries that are sitting out there and have been designed by other people. So traceability is really key here. Explanability, I will get back to that. It's uh, a main point uh, mentioned by Sabine, by the way. Communication, communication about the AI system, about, and this is of course by the uh, commercialization, the designers, what this system is able to do, not to do, uh, I would say all it's able to do, all it's able, it's not able to do or should not do, should be communicated. And also by the AI system, which means the system is transparent, that you know that you're interacting with the AI system. Auditability is of course necessary for that because and this comes from also from accountability because the AI system uh, has to be auditable if something goes wrong, but also the design process itself has to be auditable. And this is also related to a kind of traceability. Uh, now, let me dig into uh, explainability for a second. Explainability is a, a really a, a concept that uh, has been out there uh, <clears throat> since uh, uh, a few years. And uh, there are uh, different understandings of it, uh, research program, it's an open issue. The AI systems uh, based on learning and deep learning are known to be black boxes. What does this mean? It means that you have a, an optimization system, a statistics uh, processing systems uh, with the data, uh, uh, which um, uh, is opaque because you don't know how to connect uh, the various parameters and there are millions or billions of them with the uh, result. So explanatory actually, uh, recently we have made a paper with, the, with colleagues and it's mentioned on the bottom of the slide. Uh, it's a survey paper. We analyzed about 400 papers on explainability. It depends, this notion depends on whom to, you are explaining what, why are you explaining something? So the end user who uh, is not uh, an AI expert, of course, or even an expert of a domain where the AI system is used has a different kind of explanation than, for example, the designer of the system, which needs to update uh, uh, their system, need to uh, uh, upgrade it, need to correct it, or the regulatory agencies uh, who uh, uh, have to certify it, for example, or the, uh, the uh, um, uh, expert, the domain expert, for example, a medical doctor uh, who uses the system for uh, diagnosing, for example, tumors. Uh, uh, also, they have a different kind of explanation about how the system arrived to a conclusion. But so it's a multifaceted issue and research is all in all these issues. And this entails also different kind of approaches, but it's a necessary feature. Why? because explanatory is a means for governance and trust. If uh, you uh, are able to uh, explain the system, to assess the system, and again, this is not magical. Uh, a lot of work is going on on that. We have a lot of results coming in showing that you can bring in uh, uh, explainability to the system without necessarily losing accuracy because sometimes you say, people say there's a dilemma between accuracy and explainability. Uh, I was personally, I was in, in, a, in a workshop recently uh, with uh, people using uh, AI systems in military applications. And they were asked, would you prefer an accurate system or an explainable system? And they said, I prefer an explainable system because I have a responsibility to deploy the system and I must know, I must know what it's doing or not doing. Uh, and I, I'm at, I, 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 have, I have my own uh, responsibility in this. 
So this is really important. Uh, and this issue of externality is, is uh, opens doors for also assessing fairness of the system because you can try to understand if the result uh, has been obtained because the database was, for example, biased or not. Uh, it has means for accountability for security and safety. And uh, in conclusion, what I would like to say is that any technology must be designed to be dependable and governable and AI shouldn't be an exception. Thank you. Sorry for that. I, I got disconnected for a bit. So, so thank you very much, uh, Raja, for this very interesting contribution. I would maybe in light of time, uh, Alyosha, uh, go over to you to see if there are questions um, from the audience or questions based on the, the handout. So the interventions that we had from uh, different um, stakeholders uh, in the preparation of the panel. Yeah, so there were actually two questions in the um, uh, chat, if you wish. One, one, I saw it a little bit late because I think refreshment didn't work, was probably to Andrea. I guess it was the question that apart from a federate EU cloud, the, whether we need regulations that encourage data sharing and algorithmic sharing so that you need to encourage people actively to share, if you wish. I think that was a question to Andrea. And there was not a real question, but there was a discussion going on in the chat, uh, whether uh, uh, about uh, to, to Sabine, if you wish, um, the question, uh, uh, when we sloppily say we want to build ethics into uh, systems, I mean, we know that ethics is not something that you can build, right? The question is a little bit more um, uh, about, about terminology, how we speak about it, right? I mean, not building ethics into machines, but what do we mean? Do we want to build moral machines? Do we want to do ethical reflect, reflections using machines, make it a little bit clearer? when we talk about ethical AI, what we really intend to do here. So I think these were the two uh, things that I would uh, bring up first and, and then we can, uh, I can come in later again if we still have time. Oh, and Joanna also raised her hand. Yeah. So let me know, should I take the data sharing and interoperability one? Um, Indeed, I think the two things are not very separate, meaning it already uh, in Gaia X, but also in the emerging design of the data spaces and the governance of data spaces, which is subject to uh, another initiative of the commission that should see the light shortly before the end of the year. Um, the, the issue is really whether it is possible to embed in the technical specification and protocols that are used in environments such as the data spaces or in Gaia X, whether it is possible to incorporate at least some elements that would uh, um, imply uh, interoperability requirements uh, and uh, mandatory data sharing. Uh, that is already a first issue. And the second is more related to competition policy or um, uh, uh, exante regulation uh, as they are emerging at the European level from the Digital Services Act, but also from the so-called new competition tool. The issue is whether data, uh, when it's accumulated in, in, in the hands of one player, makes that player unattackable, if you wish, from a potential new entrance, or whether data could be configured from a regulatory perspective as an essential facility or an important barrier to entry. And in those cases, uh, uh, data could be, uh, well, the, the, the compulsory sharing of data could be imposed through the means of competition policy or through regulatory means. There's a third thing that could be said that is whether, whether data um, and compulsory data sharing could be imposed for good uh, for specific important data sets that could be used, uh, for example, for sustainability purposes, uh, for uh, achieving uh, uh, common goods uh, uh, or uh, common public goods as they are often called in the literature. And, um, and in those cases, you also need a sort of a taking or an expropriation requirement, if you wish, although it's uh, an improper uh, use of this term meaning uh, mandated compulsory sharing for uh, the, uh, the achievement of, the, of a superior interest, which could be, for example, the protection of um, the health of the citizens in, in the case of a pandemic. Uh, all these are cases in which the front of potential mandatory data sharing is advancing. 
in none of them we've seen a concrete realization of this, if not a little bit on competition policy, especially in Germany. But I mean, the, many of these things will happen, in my opinion, during the course of 2021. So maybe in a year from now, we will be talking a lot more about um, uh, when, under what conditions, why, how uh, uh, can uh, um, uh, companies or businesses uh, um, be forced to share their data or uh, engage in forms of um, uh, mandatory data sharing uh, in specific in specific settings. Okay, so that much. Thank you for data sharing. And now I think then it's Sabine now maybe commenting a little bit more on what, what we mean by, by, by building ethics into machines. Yeah, um, so I highlighted the design process as um, an important um, door opener for this. So at the moment we have a gap. So we um, formulate values like transparency or fairness, or we want to have um, social preserve, social cohesions with the applications. But the difficulty is to operationalize this and to bring this into the technological product. And as I said, there are so many applications of these AI uh, softwares that I'm very skeptical that we will have one answer to this and that we really need to look at domain specific applications and really enter the concrete product development process. And there we can work with the people actually designing this and exploring together in the earlier conceptual phases, the scenarios. And in these scenarios, we can then see where potential unwanted outcomes lie there. And then we can start to discuss how can we do, um, develop different design options to avoid these outcomes. So this is when I say bring ethics into the machine. So this is a very procedural approach. It's a very iterative approach. It is deeply entrenched in the design process itself. And it's, and for this, I think you need on the one hand, this domain knowledge, what I said, but also this reflection, reflective knowledge from those disciplines, which broaden up the perspective, not looking too closely only on the technology, but the whole setting with embedded in the society. And we need this dialogue and this jointly effort there to really outline the, the potential unwanted outcomes for later uses and broaden the perspectives. And broadening the perspective also means bringing societal actors in there because only then we get a more robust knowledge about potential outcomes, about what we really want as a society, as applications and not. And this is a very procedural approach and, and very interactive and approach bringing ethics into the system via the design process. So, yes, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, before I hand over to Joanna, then I will take this opportunity to, to once again go quickly through the handout or you, Natalie, you are raising no, I, I, I maybe wanted to also ask Raja's opinion on this, if, if you wish, oh. Raja, to, to have it more detailed towards transparency and explainability, but if not in, in general. Yes, uh, I think, I mean, Sabine explained very well what is the ethical design process, which takes into account values of the stakeholders who, who are impacted in the, in the system and uh, tries to identify exactly the components of these values and uh, uh, to uh, uh, compare priorities because, uh, the, of course, these values might be sometimes in tension between each other and, and come up with a uh, technical solution afterwards because the process has to be uh, indeed uh, started uh, from the beginning uh, to, to provide a system that can be compliant with the values that uh, 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 we are mentioning. And, and this is where indeed explainability, I think, is a key component because uh, you cannot just uh, do this uh, while looking only on the performance of the system. You have to understand how it connected all the bits and pieces together and why it arrived to a given conclusion so that you can really uh, uh, work on, on uh, uh, modifying what should be modified uh, and not the other way around. So it's not just 
the issue of performance and accuracy. It's really that we need to understand how uh, the conclusion was reached. And therefore, it is a technical uh, uh, aspect, of course, which is uh, uh, implied here. This then nicely, before I hand over to, to Joanna, this nicely leads to some things that we've read in the handout that you find on the bottom if you scroll down in Woover in the, on the um, session page. Andrea Martin from IBM, she said, we to ensure trustworthiness during development, training and production, and uh, we need skills for everyone who creates, applies and monitors AI solutions. And she says this requires interdisciplinarity and collaboration, right? We didn't talk about that a lot. And Oliver Suchy from uh, the head of German trade union says, of especially the workers, they need to be put in a state so that they can co-design and help uh, uh, make sure that they, that they can trust in the AI system and that they help them uh, to get uh, to, to keep a lively workplace. And thirdly, Leonie Binding from Stiftung Neue Verantwortung says, we also need to build a, maybe something like a citizen council or we need formats, we need structures where people can have these interdisciplinary discussions. They don't happen just because, right? And we have to enable these discussions. We need to have spaces where they can happen. So these are three aspects I just want to throw in before I hand over to, to Joanna. And if we have time in the end, so maybe you want to comment on, uh, uh, on, on any of these yeah, more, more procedural uh, questions, if you wish. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk about this. So uh, th thanks for a little more time. Um, I, I want to just say quickly about the, the data uh, issue. Um, I, and then I, but mostly I want to talk about the design issue. So quickly about the data issue, it, it, some people just think that the more data we have, the more intelligence we get, and that isn't how it works. So machine learning is a statistical process and you don't need infinite amounts of data. It's like, you don't have to take a poll of the entire country to, you know, to, to form, uh, well, yeah, we are actually all seeing how sometimes we're getting good at evading the polls, but anyway, um, the, the point is that we can capture data incredibly rapidly now. And again, what I was talking about with infrastructure before, we, we very, very fast uh, at capturing lots of data. So uh, when we have emergencies like the COVID, it's important, it's funny, a lot of the people in, uh, that work in human rights are worried about people who call uh, emergencies too easily and you know, shut, down, shut down the internet or whatever and try to, try to stop everything because just because they're losing power in an election or something. But now is when we should be declaring a state of emergency and saying that the kinds of data access we're giving right now are not going to persist in normal times. So there's a use to these emergency laws. And I think it's important to recognize that there, that there can be differences and that and, and when, when we do and don't do these things. Um, but anyway, I, I'm more interested in coming back to this design thing. Yeah, my PhD was actually iterative design of, of human-like AI. Uh, I, I, and I, I, I really want to, uh, that was, that was uh, so I, we didn't call it transparency back then, but I was specifically working on the problem of trying to make it easier for people to understand and therefore develop uh, their systems. And this brought, this is how it brought Raj and I to get to know each other was that, uh, sorry, uh, could you close the door to the living room? I'm on a call. Uh, thanks. Sorry, someone just came home. <laughs> so uh, the uh, thank you. <laughs> so so uh, the the it's important to know that although all the processes we've been talking about are important, uh, they aren't going to solve everything. When you bring in a heterogeneous group of people to try to figure out uh, what what would they like to have. They're going to want things, like I said, that aren't true, right? They're going to think that the robot that has no brain whatsoever is more human than the robot that's actually working. Um, they're they're going to uh, they're going to want things that are that are physically impossible, like omniscience, like that there can be no mistakes made, there could be no racism expressed or whatever. That we should check that ahead. So while we're doing all these processes, it is important to put a thread of transparency through. And I think one of the most important things to talk about in context of this deep learning thing is that it's not that we need to know every bit of what every weight is doing, that's not a problem. We need to control the human design processes and to hold people to account for following good process. And that's something that we've developed over the centuries for handling corporations and for handling people that sell us products. And the problem right now is that people weren't aware that they could apply those same kinds of rules into software. And yes, AI is software. 
So um, I, I, I want to go back uh, a little bit, and, and I originally was going to try to ask a question, Sabina. So the, 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 um, uh, the, this example, the, this motivating example at the beginning, uh, as a British person, I was a little offended to see Grenfell uh, uh, Tower used as a hypothetical Berlin uh, disaster when it was a real British disaster. But, 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 the, but the, I'm more worried about this idea that uh, this robot that worked really well, but then turned out to be racist, uh, racist. It turned out to be not as able to detect uh, uh, people of color as people that were Caucasian, that it gets shut down and that's somehow a bad thing. What would actually happen because it's a robot is that you would retrain it, right? You would, you, would, you, would, you would change, it's a software system. I mean, it's a hardware and a software system if it's a robot. So these are artifacts. These are things that we can continue to improve. And I think that's a really uh, important problem. Uh, so I, that was one challenge. And then the other was, with this design process, how do you feel about the role of expertise? Because it is definitely in a situation now where sometimes people that bring, you know, factual knowledge about things like computational complexity, that there are mathematical facts or scientific facts, uh, can can get uh, thrown out uh, in in some uh, social political context. So so how how do you uh, in your design processes? How, I, have you had any problems with that? Have you had people come up with sort of unrealistic demands? Has it, has it, have you had collapses of that? Or do you have a way to sort of uh, counter, counter those two things? I'm, I'm afraid I have to ask you for a quick answer because for the, for the flow of the conference, we need to close at some point for oh. people to give a chance to move on and also for, for using the technology for, for other sessions. So then I would really uh, take this as the, as the final word. It has been a really, really good discussion. And I think we need to uh, follow up on it on, uh, uh, at, the, at the next uh, possible occasion. So I, I let me uh, the, thank you, everyone. I don't know, Natalie, whether you also, before Sabine gets the last word, do you want to say some final? We'll maybe wait until Sabina has the last word okay, and then then we show do it one way. more slide on like sponsor yeah. acknowledgement Great. and things like okay. that. So Sabina, go. <laughs> I, I agree with Joanna that this co-design cannot solve everything. This is why I said it, it must be a, an element of a portfolio of different measures. And yes, you can retrain the robot, but um, before we detect these deficiencies, um, they become, these systems become normative. They also start to shape our society and our behavior. So we need to avoid these field experiments out there because then they all already start to alter society maybe in a way we don't to want to have it. So the challenge is to detect earlier these deficiencies and to already make sure in the design process that these outcomes don't happen. I think this needs to be discussed maybe more uh, deeply, but yeah, as yeah. I tried to short answer. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree that there was a lot of food for thought in the session, and I would very much uh, like to continue the discussion. Maybe we can already on WUVA, and we can indeed on, on next occasions, or maybe throughout EBDBF. So, uh, but I need to close. We need to leave the platform to the next session. Uh, I would, um, on behalf of Alyosha, of Freik, and of myself, thank you very much to all the panelists. I loved it. I really enjoyed it. I was very happy with all your interventions and contributions. And I, I wrote down so many questions. I don't know, maybe we'll get back to you on the email. Um, so thank you also to the organizing committee of the track four. So Stephanie, Jack, Freik, Alyosha, and acknowledgement to all the sponsors uh, of EBDVF for making this discussion also possible. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone, and hope to see you again soon. Virtually, it will be probably and in person. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.